Hello, Vashon. Happy to be here. <laughs> so it's really my pleasure and honor to introduce Temple Grandin to you tonight. My name is Julie Forbes. I'm the host and producer of a radio show called The Dog Show with Julie Forbes. It airs once a week live on AM 1150 locally, Wednesdays at 2. And it's also a free podcast on iTunes, The Dog Show with Julie Forbes. <clears throat> and we uh, replayed one of my first interviews with Temple Grandin, um, so it's the most recent one listed. So Temple Grandin is a professor of animal science at the Colorado State University. She's an autism advocate and a consultant in the livestock industry and for animal behavior. She has a number of wonderful publications for sale outside. If you haven't purchased any books or gotten them signed, she will be here after uh, for a bit to sign books as well. And I'm just not going to delay her presence any longer. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Temple Grandin. Really good to be here today. A lot of things to talk about tonight. So I might as well get uh, going with it. And I'm going to be talking some about animal behavior, some about autism, and I kind of like going back and forth between different kinds of things, because I like to bust down silos. Okay, tomorrow I'm going to be over at the uh, dog trials. That's a lot of people working out in the field. And I'm also going to discuss tonight some of the interesting research that's going on with, uh, with dogs and with other animals. We need to be getting across different disciplines and communicating. Now, the thing I want to start out with is what would happen, there's some really great innovators today in today's educational system. There's some great people out there that had a very different, unconventional path to a successful career. What about Jane Goodall? I looked up her, her biographies, and I was kind of shocked to find out that she started her famous work with a two-year secretarial degree. I'm not kidding. That's what she had. It was equivalent to an associate's. She's from England, so it would have been called something else. She was originally hired to be a secretary. Talk about getting in the back door. A really good example of that. And how about Thomas Edison? He'd probably be labeled autistic today. And in his day, he was labeled a hyperactive, addled high school dropout. That was Thomas Edison. What would happen to him today? I'd be really, really concerned. Steven Spielberg, bullied in school, dyslexic. I didn't have a great time in school. He got rejected from a top film school because he only had like C as in Charlie grades, not very good grades. But the thing that saved Steven Spielberg was his um, Super 8 movie camera. Exposure to the career early in life. That's really important. And here's an interesting book about a person that was a bit different. This is the rocket guy. Severely bullied in school. Really, really bad. I got bullied in school, and the only places I was not bullied in school is where I had a shared interest with peers, and that was horseback riding. That's one of the things that really saved me. There's this Dragon spaceship docking with a space shuttle. I'm kind of a space nerd. I'm going to show you some space shuttle simulator pictures. I got a chance to go to NASA. There I am in the control room. The actual <laughs> space shuttle control, uh, not the space shuttle, the um, space station control room. And you might wonder, why does the control room have nobody in it? <laughs> I'll tell you why. You know how when you're going on certain roads, you know just when your cell phone's going to stop working? Well, as the space station goes around, it has like six-minute blackout zones. Even if there was an emergency, you could do nothing about it, so you can just guess where they're at right now. <laughs> because they are in the no-cell zone right now. And there's the space station simulator. That was um, really cool getting to see that. Now, what are some of the common denominators of some of these unique people that are different? They grew up with lots of books. They also had early exposure to career interests. Now, one of the things I hope to see over the dog trials tomorrow is a lot of young people. We've got to get young people interested in things like dogs. Get them off the video games. I'm seeing too many really smart kids, and they're getting addicted to video games, and they're having a lousy outcome. 
I'll tell you what I'm seeing at the autism conferences. There seem to be two kind of ways these kids go. Learn how to work when they're in high school. Yes, and I went to the School of Horse Barn Management. I calculated yesterday how many horse stalls I cleaned. It was like over 5,000 of them over a period of years. And one of the things I learned from that is I learned how to work. Also, I was not over-specialized. And then, later on, after I'd done a lot of horse stall management, I was exposed to my science teacher. I was now ready to start studying. Here's an interesting paper. A Nobel Prize winner was 50% more likely to have an arts and crafts hobby compared to just a regular scientist. Hobbies such as painting, acting, music, photographer, building things. One of the worst things the schools have done is taking out all the hands-on classes. If I hadn't had hands-on classes like art and sewing when I was in elementary school, I would have just gone absolutely nowhere. And I was the second girl in our school to get into woodworking class. Really, really liked that. The other thing is, a lot of these kinds of classes I show here on this slide are not going to get replaced by computers in the future. I just was talking to somebody out at the book table, uh, and they had, a, they had a, a daughter that was doing data entry. Yeah, you better get a new job. That one's going away. But things like skilled trades, someone's still got to fix the self-driving trucks. That stuff is not going to go away. Theater's not going away. Do you think somebody wants to watch a bunch of robots when you could watch Peter Pan in this theater? That was the show that was on today. That's a lot more fun. How about little Stevie Jobs here? Bullied in high school again? Yeah, he's probably on the spectrum. And how about little Albert? No speech until age three? Where would they go today? And both of these guys had creative hobbies. Steve, it was calligraphy, and Einstein played the violin. I'm seeing a lot of kids that get labeled autistic, dyslexic, ADHD. Don't get too hung up on these labels. They're half based on science and the other half of his doctors squabbling in conference rooms at nice hotels like Marriott's and Hyatt's. <laughs> and I am being absolutely serious about that. And I'm getting concerned that a lot of these kids are getting screened out. There's an awful lot of people who's super good with animals. They may be a little dyslexic, maybe ADHD, maybe not your super student. Let's get more kids out there. And I hope I see lots of kids out there tomorrow at the dog trials, because I have gone to other on um, dog training things, and I'm mean, all gray hair like me. I can talk about gray hair. I'm going to be 70 this summer, so it's okay for me to talk about that. Okay, let's look at famous business people that were, were dyslexic. Jet Blue, ADHD. Head of IKEA, ADHD and dyslexia. Now, you look at some of the people that are really creative. A lot of them did not complete a conventional educational path. They also did not over-specialize. You know, there's a tendency sometimes, some of these grade, I, grade A super smart graduate students, I had a plant scientist tell me, he'd get these kids in this lab and they didn't have any creativity. Super smart, but super specialized. This is one of my most important slides. This is the different kinds of minds. Now, when I first started my work with animals, I didn't know that I was a super visual thinker. Everything I think about is a picture. I thought, everybody thought in pictures. Can't do algebra. So how did I get through college without algebra? Well, thank goodness, in 66 and 67, finite math was the required class. And a lot of kids can't do algebra, they can do geometry. Well, let them do geometry then. Another kind of mind is the pattern thinker. This is the mathematician. They think in patterns. These are your programmers, your engineers. Then you got the verbal facts thinker, thinks all in words. Now you want to understand animals, you're going to have to get away from language because it's sensory based. Their memories are pictures. Their memories are sounds. You know, an emotion is conveyed by the tone of voice. I was just talking to Julie this morning and I was telling her about it, I went over to a really nice dinner party and I was over by the buffet table, and their dog had just started to take a snack off the buffet table. I'm like, ah! And the dog slunk off. I'd never even seen that dog before, but I wasn't going to let him have our dinner. <laughs> and I did, right at the 
the moment he was going to get some of the meat, I did this sharp sound. You know, definitely was not a soothing sound. I just did it instinctually. You know, the dog knew exactly he wasn't supposed to be snacking off the buffet table. <laughs> now, one of the problems you have with the verbal thinking is you tend to overgeneralize. Let's look at solving some animal behavior problems. I'll have somebody come up to me, and I get these kind of questions all the time. What do I do about a crazy dog? What do I do about my horse goes berserk? I don't have enough information to answer it. Or they'll say, what do I do about autistic behavior in the classroom? Well, I don't know, because I don't have enough information. I have to ask a lot more questions. You might be looking at this slide about the different kinds of minds and go, well, this, well, how do you know this is really true? Well, in my book, The Autistic Brain, which we incidentally have out on the book table, I've got studies for the evidence-based. And when they did the studies, they didn't do it with people with autism. They took artists for one group and engineers and architects for the other group. And they gave them a whole bunch of perceptual tests. Edison simply said, I'm not a mathematician. I can always hire mathematicians, but they can't hire me. And there's my book, The Autistic Brain. Now, I think you can get so over-specialized that you're not going to be that good at problem solving. Isaac Asimov kind of summed that up when he said, a degree is the first step down a ruinous highway. You don't want to waste it, so you go into doctoral research and you end up a thoroughgoing ignoramus on everything in the world except for one subdivisional sliver of nothing. <laughs> That's what Isaac Asimov had to say. All right, let's start looking into the future and things that computers can do. Well, computers are going to get really good at doing super specialized tasks, like take away the radiologist's job, the internist's job, the dermatologist's job. Artificial intelligence is going to get those jobs. It's not going to get the secretary's job. It's not going to get the frontline nurse's job, you know, people working frontline on things. Okay, here's an article that came out in Nature about two months ago, an artificial intelligence program that can uh, diagnose melanoma more accurately than uh, people can. Now, how does this work? I've been reading some of the literature, and the thing that's been super interesting to me is that the way the AI programs are trained is exactly like how my mind works. I am a bottom-up thinker. Word thinkers think top down. You have a hypothesis, try to cram all the data into it. Bottom up thinkers, and I think animals are bottom up thinkers too. Everything is learned by specific example. So when I was a little kid, how did I learn that a dog wasn't a cat? First of all, I separated them by size. That worked fine until our neighbors got a dachshund. <laughs> so then I had to study this dachshund and find some features that she had that dogs had and cats did not have. Barking and the dog smell. Also the shape of the nose. Specific examples. You want to teach a concept like up and down. You give five or six examples. The plane went up in the air. I jumped up. I put a cup up on the shelf. I went up the stairs. You give different examples. That's the same way you train the artificial intelligence system. It works exactly the same way. The other thing about animals is they're sensory based, they're not word based. And I learned everything by specific example. That's why it's so important to get these kids out doing a lot of stuff because you gotta fill up the database. In order to train the AI program to diagnose melanoma, it was shown over a thousand verified pictures of melanoma. Then it was shown several thousand pictures of other stuff that's not melanoma. That's how you train it. Lots and lots of different specific examples. Okay, understanding animal behavior. Visual thinking helped me. I started out in the feed yards and I'd notice that cattle get scared of a chain hanging down in a chute. Well, I was noticing this. I didn't know at the time I was a visual thinker. I thought, why are other people not noticing these things that I notice? And I had a fun time in Ireland about a month ago. Oh, they rented this big black executive helicopter. This is like super cool. We fly to this beef plant and we land on its front lawn. 
and I go into the plant and they were having trouble with their cattle because their cattle would not enter the chute. And I looked at it and there were six holes about this big in the wall and we covered them with duct tape. It fixed it. It was that simple. That was a month ago. That wasn't something I did 20 years ago. That's something I did last month. Then I just went to pork plant last week and the pigs wouldn't go around this one corner and there was a six inch crack underneath the gate and they could see shadows moving, stuffed it up full of cardboard, fixed it. And I suggested that they replace it with conveyor building, might be a better material. But even though I've got checklists, people are not seeing it. And there's a lot of animal behavior in working with the uh, dogs. One of the things that dogs do is to get on the edge of the cattle's flight zone, or the sheep, so okay, you're doing the sheep. But you get the dog works the edge of the flight zone. Uh, the dog knows how to do that. Different dogs have different uh, drives. Now, another thing in talking about animal behavior I want to bring up is that a brain can be more social or a brain can be more cognitive or thinking. Autism in its mildest forms is just personality variation. You wouldn't have any computer people, you wouldn't have any technology without a little bit of autism. So you can be more thinking or you can be more social emotional. And I found some fascinating papers from Europe on the difference between wolves and domestic dogs. And the basic difference is we have bred them to be super social. Because a wolf can watch another wolf open a box and the wolf will just do it. But the domestic dog is so busy asking us for help, he doesn't pay enough attention. <laughs> the other thing is there's emotional traits. In um, Animals Make Us Human, one of my books, I discuss seven emotional traits that have been identified by Jack Panskep. He's at, um, up at Washington State University. You have fear, that's an emotional trait and it can either be high or low. Sort of a magic a music mixing board where you can adjust the volume of different emotional traits. You've got fear, make it high and low. You've got rage, that's anger. You've got separation distress. You leave the dog home alone and ate the house. That is a separate trait from fear. Then you got seek. One lab's a go-getter that wants to chase the ball all the time. And then the great service lab, he could care less about the ball. Then you've got sex. You've got the mother young nurturing, the oxytocin system, and then you got play. And I was reading some books, I get sent galley proofs on dog books, and I read a galley proof recently on a book up all about police dogs. And then I read another book the other day, it's gonna be a have dog uh, will travel about a blind person getting a service dog. And I got thinking about these seven emotional traits and how these dogs are different. The police dog would be bred to be low fear, high seek, Low separation distress, probably not you know, very much on, on the affection side, where the Labrador dog for the guide dog, I want a low seek, because I don't want it chasing balls. It's a guide dog. Be really gentle and really, you know, want to love up on people, and be low fear. And I could just look at the dogs and I could just see where you'd set the switches on the music mixing board. And there's starting to be genomics to back this up. Then I found this paper, I was up at Kansas State University, had an afternoon off, so I started a surf Google Scholar. And I found this fantastic paper on social versus less social animals. Like lions, for example, are more social than the solitary panther or cougar. Guess what? There's genetics in there that matches sort of like autism. Now, does that mean that panthers are defective? Absolutely not. This is just normal variation. Then you get into the extreme parts of the autism spectrum. Yeah. When I was four years old, I had no speech and I looked really terrible. Okay, let's look at this uh, alleyway. If the wind's just blowing those fans, moving them slowly, that cattle are not gonna go in there. They may also be balking at the reflection on the floor. Non-slip flooring, super essential. All right, let's see how you guys are at visual thinking. How many of you saw that animal looking at the sunbeam? Raise your hand. Oh, we're doing quite well here. We're doing much, much better than a lot of audiences I've shown this to. I can tell you, mathematicians, they do terrible at this. <laughs> the mathematical mind doesn't see this. This is why Fukushima burned up. And what I learned is 
they didn't see water coming in there and flooding it. It's not a good idea when you live next to the sea. But that's super important emergency cooling pump in a non-waterproof basement. That's what they did. I can't design a nuclear reactor, but all I know is that electric pumps don't run out of water. I do know that. <laughs> There's different ways you can teach math. We need to be taking the students that are different and take the thing they're good at and build on it. And one of the big problems is students aren't getting exposed to enough stuff to decide what they want. Two days ago on the plane, I had picked up a Time magazine at the airport, and they had a big article in there on community colleges. And they had this really fun community college that was either in North or South Dakota. Oh, they had wind turbine stuff in there and solar panel stuff and irrigation stuff. Get these kids in there and get them working on things that could turn into real jobs. And there was a, a guy from the Urban Institute that said that one of the problems today, these kids go to college, they don't know what they want to do because they simply haven't been exposed to enough stuff. There's some really cool little origami things. Now, when I think about something like a church steeple, I visualize pictures of specific ones. Okay, in hotel, we were discussing this afternoon the world's worst hotel that I was in, Phoenix, Arizona, totally awful hotel. <laughs> and then I tend to remember the super weird hotel. How about super weird? I go in this hotel, it's so classy in New York, it doesn't even have its name in it. And I go into this lobby that looks like Mr. Neelix's bar in Star Trek. <laughs> and then they got these French upholstered chairs in there, the wrong furniture for Star Trek, but the seat of the chair is a giant Doberman mouth with one jaw here and the other jaw here to bite your butt. <laughs> I mean, talk about a weird hotel lobby. Yeah, your average Holiday Inn Express, I don't remember that. I think that's good, because I probably got a good night's sleep there. So I think about church steeples, I see specific ones. But when I asked the physicist, he got motion of people praying. There were no pictures. It was patterns. And when I asked the verbal person, they got a pointy thing. That's all they see is this. Very abstract. Top-down thinkers are extremely abstract. We need to get a lot more bottom-up thinking. Well, here's what really helped me, was learning how to work. You get some of these kids, they get a label. There's a tendency to overprotect them. I, I saw a 13-year-old boy, fully verbal, smart kid. He'd never shopped by himself. I was shopping when I was seven. How about walking the neighbor's dog? I noticed he had a farmer's market down here. That'd be the perfect place for a 12-year-old kid who's socially awkward to learn some social skills. Always looking for that sort of thing. Long to church, church usher. Work in the retirement home. I suggested to the lady that's doing data entry, she li said she likes people at the nursing home. Let's get her fully switched over to a job at the nursing home before the computers get the data entry job. Because I want to have a gradual transition. Sudden transitions are just too upsetting. Okay, here's my work uh, history. Sewing job at 13 for freelance seamstress. My mother just set it up. Lots of horse stall cleaning at 15. I was a problem student. I got thrown out of ninth grade for throwing a book at a girl who teased me and called me a retard. So I got this big, heavy social studies book and I hurled it across the room and beamed her with it. And, and I was thrown out of school for that. So I ended up going to special school and I basically cleaned horse stalls and took care of the horse barn for three years. Didn't do any studying, but I didn't have to attend class. I had to attend meals. The one thing they absolutely didn't allow is let me become a recluse in my room. And then at the end of the fourth year, I got my great science teacher who got me turned on to studying. I learned roofing while I was there. Lots of fun. There was a partial eclipse while we were roofing the dairy barn. That was real fun. Sign painting. And then when I was in college, I did internships. I worked at a research lab, also worked at a program for autistic kids. And I did a lot of carpentry work, along with the horse stall cleaning. And I, when I look back on this, one of the things I was learning is I was learning how to work. And I'm seeing too many kids get a label, they're graduating from high school, they've never had a job. In some cases, they've graduated from college. And then they have a horrible time in the workplace, haven't had a job. 
Well, when I was getting my master's degree, I was painting signs for the Arizona State Carnival. And that's a really stupid exhibit. How about a freezer chest with a dummy in it? That was a Himalayan monster. I mean, totally stupid exhibit. And that's me up there. I don't even know how I got up there on a little tiny ladder and I painted that sign, but I did. And there's my sign painting truck. And I was not over-specialized. Well, I had an old-fashioned liberal arts education, and I had to take English literature. And I thought I was going to hate this class. I turned out I loved it because they explained emotionally what the authors were trying to get across. So that helped with social skills. And there's actually some studies that show that studying humanities, especially in the classical way of studying them, can help you with um, learning social skills. And I had uh, great mentors and all the projects that the movie shows I actually did do and learn how to drive. Give you a little hint, teaching some of these kids that are different on driving, it takes longer. Uh, driver's ed throws them into it too quickly. I recommend a tank of gas on a totally safe place before we go near any traffic. And at my aunt's ranch, it was three miles up to the mailbox and three miles back for an entire summer. That was over 200 miles of easy roads. <laughs> now, what would happen to me today? Well, a lot of autistic kids are getting good early intervention. Um, I had symptoms of severe autism. You get kids when they're little, they can look really severe. You work on them, they kind of pull into three groups. The ones that are fully verbal can read USA Today, read and write, that level or much higher. Then you have kind of a middle group, and then you have a more, much more severe group that may have epilepsy on top of autism and has trouble uh, dressing themselves. Okay, I would get good uh, early intervention today, but I'd be a prime candidate for video game addiction. We have got to get this under control. And I have a book out there I did with Deborah Moore on The Loving Push, and we reviewed the literature on the video game addictions and autism. It's not pretty. I'm not suggesting banning them, but we need to limit it to one hour a day. We've got to get them out doing other things and give them choices. Well, you could do Boy Scouts, you could do karate. Give them choices. And we need to be uh, getting all the opportunities we can for hands-on learning. Work experience that needs to start in middle school with helping out at the farmer's market, walking dogs for the neighbors. We've got to do things that are substitutes for the old paper route. Okay, here was a scientist reaction to taking out the hands-on classes in the schools. And he said, practical experiments teach the reality of science with all its frustrations and rewards. Yeah, sometimes the experiment doesn't work in lab. It turns out that I got a huge visual thinking circuit. Doing some of these brain scans, that was kind of really exciting, and a journey to the center of my mind. And, and when I think back when I started my animal work, I didn't even know that other people didn't think in pictures the way I did. I said, why can't they see these things? Well, here's where I had trouble with algebra. There's a wrecked algebra department. <laughs> I've got... Uh, I have a very, very bad working memory. And so employers might get frustrated and go, well, I already showed this kid five times how to clean the ice cream machine. Why can't he remember how to do it? You've got to give them a checklist. Step one, step two, step three, step four, just with little bullet points to jog the memory. That's all you have to do. Now, some industries have a big academic barrier of entry and others don't. One advantage of the meat industry is there's no academic barrier of entry. I actually was very interested in biomedical research, but I couldn't do the math. You see, there's two parts of designing stuff. There's the industrial design part, and that's what I've done with a lot of my cattle stuff. And then there's the more engineering part of it. For example, Steve Jobs, an artist, made the iPhone interface simple to use. Engineers made it work. And just the other day, I was reading a review on all these new iPhone features. Design the interface. It's going to get too complicated. And thank goodness, in 1967, algebra was not the required class. I took finite math with lots of statistics. And mother pounded open the back door of a small college because I had horrible SIT scores. And I was taken in on probation. And I worked really hard. I got through the finite math class. Thank goodness it wasn't algebra. I had a, came out of an educated family. My art ability was always encouraged. 
And when I was a little kid, I spent hours making airplanes and kites. And the thing that bothers me, if you go on Google Images and you type in children in costumes, there's almost no homemade costumes. We made all our costumes. Mother read to us. Books were a very big part of our life. My two favorite books in elementary school were about famous inventors and black beauty. Now, these aren't the actual. I looked up on Amazon to try to find some substitutes that were as close as I could find to the books that I had as a child. The one on inventors is from the Smithsonian. It looked like a really nice book. But um, books were a big part of my life, very big part of my life. Riding horses, I also had early exposure to career interests. I went out to my aunt's ranch. That's how I got interested in beef cattle. It gets back to getting exposed. I got exposed to the optical illusion room in a, from a science movie, which is shown really accurately in the movie. You got to expose kids to interesting stuff to get them interested in interesting stuff. Now, how did I get my business started? When you're weird, what you got to do is you got to show off your portfolio. And another thing I figured out very early on is you could snag the business card of the right person. You could get in the back door. And there's a scene in the movie where I go up to the editor of the farm ranchman and I got his card. I actually did that. And one big problem I'm seeing today is problems with writing skills in students. Yes, college students have worse writing skills than I had in ninth grade after I got kicked out of school. When I was thrown out of ninth grade, I had better writing skills than some of the students have today. And you know why their writing skills are horrible? Because nobody copy edited their work. Mark up the work, get them to correct the grammar, and then uh, redo it. So right now, half the cattle in the US are handling equipment I've designed for large packing plants. I think that's doing pretty good for somebody you thought was mentally retarded. So how did I get those jobs? I sent my portfolio to, to Cargill or in late 80s. And I sent them this drawing and this brochure and plastic pages that had a lot of pictures of jobs. Here's the original dip fat from the original brochure. What I wanted to show them was something that would be a 30 second wow, where they go, wow. And parents will come up to me and say, well, my kid's really good at art or really good at this. I say, have you got it on the phone? You need to sell some jobs for your kid. Because one of the things you gotta learn how to do is how to build projects other people want. And you've got to get them done on time. That's another thing. You've got to learn some work skills. I heard a sad case about a kid with mild autism who went to a really famous design school, did super good. But then when he got his first job, he didn't want to make his employer's stupid bird videos. Well, I'm sorry, it is work. And you better make really good stupid bird videos and don't call them stupid and put them in your portfolio so you can get a better job. <laughs> That's what you need to be doing. One of the things, you've got a lot of tech industry right here. There's no barrier of entry. You show the right code to the right people. The problem is kids aren't getting exposed to code. I just talked to a kid this, mor uh, this morning on the electric tram at the Denver airport. Uh, he learned coding in high school, C++ and JavaScript. These lessons are free online, but kids aren't getting exposed to it. And the classes are free. Yeah, maybe Amazon's hiring. They're right here in town. You know, people lots of times don't see the door. It's right there. And there's uh, the replica for the movie that they um, uh, built of my facility. There's uh, getting started in construction. And one of the things that working in construction for so many years has affected how I think. When you're in construction, I had to sell that job, design that job, supervise its construction, and get it done. And I want to see smart kids going into good jobs. I've been to Silicon Valley. You want to see all the mild autism that's there. So one kid's going to Silicon Valley, and another kid just as smart as playing video games in the basement. We've got to not let that happen. And there's the uh, original drawings for the dip vat. We got a beautiful projector that didn't corrupt these drawings. And so what I did is show my drawings off. I, well, I can remember when I first drew these drawings. These, I did these in 1978. 
And I did that drawing right there. And I remember looking at that drawing when I got it all done. I couldn't believe I'd done it. <laughs> and here's some of the um, pictures I put in the packet that I sent to the head of Cargill. Because you definitely want stuff that's sort of a 30-second wow. Open up that portfolio, wow. Well, now you put your portfolio on LinkedIn. <laughs> and if you're in Romania, your portfolio is what prestigious places have you hacked? And what kind of programming they had? And you put that up and you go to jail for about three months and then you get great, great computer security jobs. <laughs> and the more prestigious the place you hacked, the better your resume. <laughs> okay. Now, I'm, you know, one of the reasons why I'm putting up all this stuff is I want a lot of young people that are different to know that I have a career, that I'm not just an autism activist. And when I first started my work with livestock, I thought I could fix everything with just the perfect equipment. If I could build the right magic equipment, everything would work fine. Uh-uh, that's not how it works. Half my clients tore it up and wrecked it. 80s and 90s, just terrible. There were a few people that did things right. That kept me going. What you gotta do is you've got to manage. The other half of the equation is management. Just like they thought you could put internet in the schools and it's gonna make the schools totally wonderful. Well, it didn't. That doesn't replace teaching. And there's a um, center track restrainer system. If you wanna see how that works, you can look it up on Beef Plant Video Tour with Temple Grandin. I'm not gonna show that now. Now what I did is I figured out five simple things to measure to evaluate slaughter plants for animal welfare. There's a tendency to get things way too complicated. Just the other day, I was at a beef meeting and they wanted to make a way to evaluate how people handle cattle at auctions. And they said, we gotta make sure they don't do aggressive cattle handling. Well, what's aggressive cattle handling? What did they do? All right, let's list it. No yelling and screaming. Don't, no repeated poking with sticks or hitting with sticks. You know, we need to define what, what aggressive cattle handling is. Well, I figured out five simple things to measure. The sort of just like traffic rules. Traffic rules work because they're really clear and they're really simple. And how many animals did you render unconscious in the first attempt? If you didn't do it perfectly, 95% of the time you were kicked off the approved McDonald's list. Boy, let me tell you. When you had the power of the golden arches behind you, things really happened. And then I figured out a measurement that was really good vocalization. Cattle moo while you're handling them and you're doing something bad to them. Falling down, electric pride use, these are outcome variables. So how can you measure just five simple things and have it work? All right, let's think about traffic. If you can enforce only three rules for traffic, what three would you enforce? Okay, I want some ideas here. What? Speeding, okay, I agree with that. Stoplight, I'd agree with that. But I find every time I ask this, almost every time, you don't give me the 800 pound gorilla. Drunk driving, drunk driving is number one. And then if I'm gonna do the top five, then it's gonna be texting and then seat belts. I put seat belts as five because they protect me, but they don't pr protect you against me. So that's why they're number five. Texting now is a $300 fine in, in Denver, Colorado. They're getting really serious about it. They're gonna pull your phone logs. Don't text and drive. That is now, you know, five years ago, that wouldn't have been a critical control point. But the trick is figuring out what are the really important things to measure. You see, it's not complicated. Oh, you get so much stuff, the government just loves vague regulations and then the Supreme Court has to fight over them because they're not written in a clear way. So in 1996, only 30% um, of the plants could pass the stunning audit. You know why they were so crummy? Broken equipment. That's management. Well, and then I got the power of McDonald's behind me. Boy, did things improve. First of all, fix your broken stuff, install some non slip flooring, supervise your employers, employers. Then I found things like covering up holes in walls, little things like that. It still blows my mind. Go into this plant, hadn't been in there 20 minutes, and we stick tape over those holes, and it fixed it. Well, I guess I got job security because that was a month ago. That wasn't something I did 20 years ago. All right, now who builds a big complicated thing, you know, like a big Cargill plant 
or even like the ferry boat thing. I was looking at the dock on the ferry boat. When I was a kid, I used to go on a ferry boat. You know what? It had exactly the same kind of drawbridge thing to load it. Hasn't changed. You know, there's some things in 60 years just don't change. There's other things that change a whole lot. And I noticed there's no computers on it. They just pressed buttons to make it go up and down. Some of our cattle ramps. You know, a lot of similarities. So we're going to, um, going to design uh, a big, huge, complicated factory. The visual thinkers actually lay out the whole factory. That's the drafting department. That's my department. The uh, millwrights, some of the real weird guys, and I worked with a lot of them, they invent, you know, marvelously uh, inventive mechanical equipment. And then the engineers with the formal degrees, the uh, power requirements, refrigeration, boilers, soil compaction, roof truss loading, they do that kind of stuff. But you need to have the whole team. And lots of times the visual thinkers don't get enough credit. At least in a meat packing plant, we're democratic. And so everybody in tech gets stuck in the boiler room office. But I went to a big fancy place. I'm not going to say where it was, but it really annoyed me. Very fancy place. And the engineers were up in this high office tower, and my department got stuck in the service corridor with the cable trays. No, you need to be giving us visual thinkers a lot more credit because you wouldn't have your project without us. Now, how do people get into jobs? Tina, project manager for our chemistry building. She's just finishing it up right now. How did Tina get this job? She was a political science major. Can you believe that? A political science major. What do you do with a political science degree? I can think of something better than going to Washington. What you start doing is answering phones for a construction company. And then that goes over to accounting. Next thing you know, she's running a project. Talk about the back door. Great career. OK. Now, in a lot of things today, we've got to have evidence-based. Some people say well, the only way you can have evidence based is to do a controlled experiment. And I go, observation is part of science. What's the controlled experiment for the Hubble Space Telescope? Do we point it at the ground? Is that the controlled experiment? Do we go dig up all the spy photos that it took before it was the Hubble Space Telescope? Because that's probably what it was <laughs> at one time. I don't know. Well, when I learned my visual thinking was different than verbal thinking or pattern thinking, it gave me a lot of insight. Different kinds of minds can complement each other's skills. But the first step you've got to do is to realize they are there. And when I think back of all the projects I worked with, feed yards and with big packing plants, you know, every single one of them, the way that jobs were split up was pretty much the same. And there's the iPhone. Easy to use, now they're making it complicated to use. We got a bad review from one of the people that evaluate tech. You know, we better let the um, visual thinkers get back on the interface. But you need the different kinds of minds. And I'm concerned the educators are screening them out. Now what I want to do right now, and we got some time now, do a bunch of questions. You can ask autism questions, animal questions, anything you want. Always like to do lots of questions. Okay, I'll pick somebody. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm okay. Go ahead, can you shout it? Sure. Um, can you talk a little bit about your mom's influence on your education and how that brought you? Well, mother was always stretching me. She was not one of these moms that overprotected. She would always keep stretching me just outside the comfort zone. Well, come on, why don't we try this? It was my mother who set up the sewing job. And I turned out to love it. Even when I had to go away to special school, she picked out three schools and she let me pick one. You know, it's, you've got to stretch. But I'm seeing too often where the mom's talking for the kid and, and the kid's not learning enough, you know, good social skills, like just learning how to shake hands with people. Okay, I'm going to pick somebody if nobody has. Okay. Oh, my first talks were terrible. Let me tell you what happened with my very, very first talk. It was in graduate school, and I panicked, and I walked out. That was my first talk. 
Now, one of the things I've learned was to make sure I had good slides to pace myself. Now, if I have to do a talk with no slides, then I will um, make like a list of bullet points on paper. I don't read scripts, but I have, but have to have bullet points and then maybe some figures that I have to write it down so I can go down through some bullet points. Otherwise, I would tend to ramble. But basically, you learn. It's what you do. You learn it by doing. And I'd read my evaluations. I remember one time I'd given some talks to the veterinary students. This was probably uh, 20 years ago. And they said, oh, Temple always gives the same lecture. And the mistake I was making is I was always using the same cattle vision slide in the beginning. I got rid of that slide. And I made sure that in the first part of the lecture, I always had something different. <laughs> I found that worked. <laughs> and then I had to differentiate between helpful comments and just nasty comments. Okay. All right. You give them choices. You give them choices. And, and when, I was, when, I, when I was 15, the opportunity came up to go to my aunt's ranch. I was afraid to go. Mother gave me a choice. I could go out there, stay for a week, and come home, or stay all summer. And I could make that decision after I got out there. I had a choice. Now, you don't, I, see, my mind only works with specific examples. See, I'm like Watson, the expert system. And, and I, I, I'll give you an example of chucking them in the deep end that doesn't work. You don't take an 18-year-old girl who's really anxious and just shove her in a clothing store at Christmas Rush. That you don't do. But you might put her in a clothing store starting, you know, one or two afternoons a week in the summer when it's not so busy. You know, work them into it. And you've got to have a boss that's willing to teach them how to do the job. It's going to be like counseling a person on how to behave in a foreign country. Like this is rude pointing in China. This is polite pointing. Somebody has to tell that to me or I have absolutely no way of knowing. But the thing is, if you don't stretch, they're never going to develop. Because the only way they get the knowledge to get less and less autistic is you've got to fill the database up. They work exactly like artificial intelligence. It's bottom up. And when I read some of the literature, like on how, and I read the article in Nature on how they trained the program to diagnose melanoma, it was classic bottom up thinking. You give it examples of melanoma and examples of not melanoma. Thousands of examples of each. And the more data you put in the database, the better they're going to think, and then they can be less rigid. Instead of having two big black and white categories, you can start having some shades of gray and put specific examples in each one of those boxes. I found, for me, travel was a great educator. I can remember my first trips to cattle things outside the United States. And I remember going to Australian beef plants, and I expected them to be worse than ours. They were gorgeous. This was 1978. You know, to go to other countries, find out it's a big world out there. Changes your viewpoint. Okay, right there. Well, I had a lot of fun in Australia. I went to the Outback uh, two years ago. We, get, we go to Darwin, Australia. We get on a barren airplane. Propeller airplane has to have a tail wheel. Nose wheels can't land on dirt strips. And we fly for about two hours straight south over absolutely nothing. And then we get to the cattle station. And you've got a huge land mass, half the size of the U.S., but the only thing you can do with that land is raise grazing animals on it. There's, not enough, there's no water. There's just enough water for wells to water the cattle. But you can't raise crops there. There's not enough rain and not enough water. You don't realize how, out, how vast the outback is until uh, you see it. Well, I'll tell you one crazy little thing. You follow the road, and the government's put up diesel-powered cell phone towers. And the pilot was yakking on his iPhone 4. And I'm looking at his GPS, and it's getting off course. And I tap it. He says, you want to fly this plane? I go, no, I'm just watching your GPS. Because <laughs> I do understand that. Okay. What country do you think has the most respect for animals? What I found on countries' respect for animals, when I started out in the 70s, 
Cattle handling was awful, awful, absolutely awful. And then in the 80s, the slaughter plants really were a mess. And then in 1999, when we started the McDonald's audits, we turned that industry around. First of all, fix your broken stuff. That's the first thing that they did. But some of the countries, in the, even in the late 70s, Sweden, Denmark, those were some of the countries, even when a lot of other places were really bad, that actually were halfway decent. Okay. Then I gotta make, then I gotta make yourself some notes where I go down with some bullet points. I don't have to have a whole book, but I need bullet points of the things I'm gonna cover. So in terms of your, your day to day life, though, you still have to have tools? No, I don't, not, not for stuff like getting up in the morning, things like that. But I find that people that are verbal thinkers underestimate the amount of time it, it takes to do stuff. You know, why do I wanna get out to the airport two hours early? Because I'd like to have an hour for a big traffic jam on the highway, and then I can still make the flight. Yeah, and there's every once in a while there is some big mess that happens. And I make the flight, and the person that allows an hour beforehand doesn't make the flight, because there's no time for some kind of problem. I think there's a burning question right there. Okay. Well, if things change the brain scans, none of the stuff I showed you is commercially available. Don't get hung up on brain scans. Everything that showed up clinically, like my ability in art really started to show up in third grade, math ability will tend to show up around second or third grade. Then build up the math. Don't make them do baby math. Let them get more advanced math. You know, let's introduce computer programming. They learn like Minecraft. Let's learn how to make Minecraft. The program's called JavaScript. Start teaching the kid that. We gotta start thinking more like the construction industry thinks. Where, where are you gonna go when you're done? And I want the kid to get a good job, a job he's gonna like. Skilled trades, man, there's a ton of jobs. Someone's gonna have to fix all these self-driving trucks. They gotta have a lot of camera junk on them and it's gonna break and it's gonna have to be checked all the time. Okay, right over here, oh, right there. I've done a lot of thinking about, um, you know, about animals. Two years ago, our uh, Department of Animal Science invited a crop scientist to come to our cattle symposium for international, um, international students. And I learned something I didn't know before, but it really made me think. And what I learned from the crop scientist is that the very best soils, the molly soils in Iowa and Illinois, were created by herds of grazing bison. Animals are part of the land. We need to be getting the grazing animals back into the crop rotations is what we need to be doing to build up long-term soil health. That's something we need to be doing. And so that's part of the land. And I feel very strongly we've got to give animals life worth living. And some people will talk about all kinds of horrible things done to farm animals. Uh, let's take the bulldog. Can't breathe, it can't walk, it can't have its babies naturally. I can tell you most cattle, I think, have a better life. Way in the back corner. Okay. Back corner. Okay, yeah. I can't see those, the lights are in my eyes. Okay. I'm gonna get a copy of this presentation Well, I have, um, I have my TED talk, my 2010 TED talk. I also have a talk I did um, in 2016 for the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. That's on templegrandin.com, and it's a presentation real similar to this. It just doesn't have as much animal stuff in it, but it has all of the education stuff. So the templegrandin.com, I've got my American Academy of Arts and Sciences talk. My TED talk has some of the same stuff. There's tons of videos. Won't be this exact talk, but you can find things that are very similar. Okay. Well, I'm not hiring, but we need to be, but looking at, at 
like I had a mom show me a great fashion art that a kid did. I said, you need to go on, on look up all the places that have a fashion department. We have one at CSU. My class got in their building. That's how I found out about it. I said, why don't you go on that website and start pulling professors' names off of that and send them a portfolio? You'll probably go in the back door. Because when you're different, you sometimes have to go in the back door. And I figured out really early in my career how to find the back doors. You could show a portfolio to the right person. You're in. Let's say you're really good at some coding. I was at an autism meeting and a kid showed me an Android phone where he'd totally redone the interface with his own interface. That's pretty impressive. But it wasn't getting shown outside the autism community. I think educators need to be getting a lot more business stuff in. How about learn about LinkedIn accounts? Learn a business magazine, subscribe to Wired, uh, Business Week, uh, Fortune, all these business magazines, so that kids can see fun stuff you can do in business. You know, well, Amazon.com warehouse is pretty cool. They've shown that in the business magazines. But kids aren't going to get interested in stuff like that unless they actually see it, or at least see pictures of it. Okay, right there. Well, right now, I kind of feel like um, um, what I need to be doing is I'm um, doing a lot of talks like this as long as my health holds out because I'd like to see help, um, help the kids that are quirky and different uh, get out there and be successful. And I hope there's a lot of kids at the dog trials tomorrow. Okay, right here. Well, the severe, one of the things, and the very, very severe ones, you've got very severe sensory problems. You know how a TV will pixelate, and the picture's all little squares, and the sound's all messed up? Well, you can have a sensor, a visual system mess up in people and get a very similar kind of problem. It worsens when they get tired. Yeah, you want some bad internet access. Um, rural area out in Iowa, outside of uh, Sioux Falls, went to a hotel, had a worthless cable system. You go in there at nine, at nine o'clock, I was watching Tanked, that show about aquariums, and it was watchable. Then as more guests come into the room, it gradually became completely useless. And this is exactly what happens when these kids get tired. So the sensory system's a complete jumble. So let's say you want to teach them something like putting on a t-shirt. You can't jerk it on fast because they can't process it. Uh, and there's a book, um, I have some information on this in uh, my Way I See It books out on the book table, also in the autistic brain. There's a book called How Can I Talk If My Lips Don't Move? You can get that one online. And it's written by a guy who's nonverbal, he looks low functioning, but he's not. Uh, but you're, they're in a disordered sensory world. You know, just imagine if you're seeing and hearing it was like a really awful TV. You know, it went from watchable where we just get an occasional square in it, and I could watch it, and then it would get more and more squares, and the sound would cut in and out more. And by 10 o'clock, I turned it off because it, the, the audio was totally gone and pixelated so much you couldn't even see the image. And there's the circuits back here in the brain that assemble the graphics file. There's four things in there, shape, color, motion, and texture. And when they get messed up, you, get, you can get pixelation. Talk to people that have described this problem. And somebody has a milder version of it, you know, may just be dyslexic. And they can be helped by printing their homework on pale pastel paper. Try lots of different colors. Okay, right there. Well, I was one of the kids that responded really well to deep pressure. And some kids really respond to deep pressure and other don't, others don't. Some kids respond really well to horseback riding because you get the rhythm and balancing at the same time. You can sometimes help trigger language. See, the problem you've got is you've got just a really wide mixture of stuff that gets a label of autism. See, that's top-down thinking. We're going to have to start subdividing it, but subdividing it based up on, on biology. Okay, right here. You talk about uh, kids getting jobs. What is your opinion about kids with moderate autism? 
Moderate autism need to get jobs, and they know, okay, I'm going to define, okay, I, some people are trying to subdivide types of autism in, in like 20 different categories. I think that's bull. I'm going to just say there's three kinds. Reads, they're 12 years old now. Reads and writes at a grown-up level. Read and write USA Today level, basic, my basic reading test. Uh, sometimes it's good to, if they're more moderate, they probably have to identify. But you take the just kind of, you know, socially awkward kid, it might be better to just say, I need a quiet place to work. Or I got to do this ice cream machine. Let me write myself down a pilot's checklist. In other words, just say some specific thing they need. I'm socially awkward. I do something stupid. You know, please pull me into the office and just tell me. Um, some, you know, sometimes this closure is good to do. Sometimes it's not. Um, and, and what, I, you know, I, what, what I've learned to do when I do a team project is I like to sit down and say, okay, now I'll do this part of the project. All the live animal handling equipment. Okay, my stuff stops here. The top of the inclined conveyor. Then the rest of the floor is somebody else's problem. <laughs> uh, where I have a clear defined part of the project, clear defined cost, what it's got to do. And I've learned a long time ago don't rub other people's noses in the mistakes. Sometimes if you can just fix them quietly, that's the thing to do. Because you want to be project loyal. Your job is to get the plant built, not to just fight with everybody. That's not the reason for the being there. Another thing is, good portfolio can make up for a lot of weirdness. People thought I was weird. I guess got to go, I got to put this drawing back up here. Okay, you put something like that up there, helps you to get respect. I'd pull one of these out, two foot, you know, 24 inches by 36 inches, pull it out of my notebook. This is all pre-internet. That got respect. Now that stuff's going to be on websites. And Okay, right here. Uh, quietly. And uh, I have a whole book out there on a guide to handle it, working with farm animals. Nice picture book. You might want to get that. And I think that will teach you a lot. And people that are working with dogs, I think, will find that book helpful because it contains uh, movement patterns for working cattle. And the sheepdog does exactly the same thing. Okay, right here. Right there. You can develop visual thinking skills somewhat. You know, I have found that, that the person that starts to just see like a pointy thing like this for the church people, I can force them dig down in the, into the visual files. But I'm not going to take a total verbal thinker and turn them to my kind of mind. Let's just sort of imagine these things, again, are on a continuum, sort of like a music mixing board. The person's in the middle, I can move it like this some, but I can't go the whole length. I think the best thing to do is to recognize that these different kinds of thinking exist. But I find a lot of people that are good with working with animals, a lot of dyslexic people are good with working with animals. There was an old study by a guy named Seabrook. And what Seabrook found is that the best dairyman that had the most productive dairy cattle was the confident introvert. That probably was somebody with mild autism. That was the best dairyman. You know, stockmanship matters. So when you're thinking about jobs, one job that can be really good for a lot of them is caring for animals. Okay, we were talking about the moderate level. Okay, they're able to shower and dress themselves. They could take care of, of calves at a dairy. That might be a perfect job for them. Can they know the difference between real work and fake work? So let's give them some real work. Cleaning horse stalls, things like that they could do. There's a lot of things that they could do. And they really like doing it. Okay. Well, you've asked a very general question about what observations from animals are applicable to humans. Well, that's almost a general, I almost can't answer it. That's too top down for me. <laughs> uh, then I start um, seeing really in inappropriate things, the word application. So now I just saw a job application like for McDonald's or something like that. That's totally, uh, totally uh, ridiculous. <laughs> I almost have to have something more specific than that. 
Now, my book, Animals in Translation, I talk a lot about how autism helped me understand animals. You might want to get that book. Then, like, we discuss it. Okay? Yeah. Yeah, and, they, and the thing, also reading some of the neuroscience, because the neuroscientists for years have known that animals have emotions. Well, also, 20 years ago, you'd have people in veterinary science and animal science questioning whether animals have emotions. It's just ridiculous. Neuroscience accepted that 30 years ago. Why do we use animals to study drugs behaviorally if they, did, if they didn't have something similar to us? All right, let's just look at some basic things. Prozac works on dogs. That's a fact. There's a lot of papers to show that. If their nervous system came from another planet, that probably wouldn't be true. All right, let's do two more questions. Okay, right there. On what? Well, it, the thing about ABA, there's so many different kinds of ABA, ranging from more flexible, modern ABA to some of the old-fashioned rigid stuff, and I don't like the old-fashioned rigid stuff. The thing I have found on teaching, when you're working with little kids, and ABA originally was invented as a little kid's program. That's what it was invented for originally. A good teacher has the knack, knowing just how hard to push. And you watch those really good teachers. Maybe they're doing ABA. Maybe they're doing pivotal response. Maybe they're doing Denver start. They're all doing the same thing. But the problem is I have seen, there's some really awful ABA. But there's a lot of other stuff that people call ABA that's working just fine. Oh, oh, oh uh, applied behavior analysis. Yeah, applied behavior analysis. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, I'm just wondering because, like, my friend has ADHD and autism. And he... Well, ADHD and autism gets mixed up all the time, and the genetics crosses over. The, the diagnosis on that gets mixed up because there's probably about 20 or 30 percent of it's the same on the crossover. Well, you guys probably have noise sensitivity. Well, you know, going on that ferry today took me back to childhood because we used to go on a ferry like that in the summer. I hated that ferry. Man, I hated it. That ferry looked just like the one I used to go on. And the reason I hated it is it had that horrible horn. And so they'd let me um, ride down below. I was up on the bow because I wanted to watch it go into the drawbridge thing. And they beeped the horn. It's just like the one they had as a child. And all I did was flinch. So this brings up the problem of how do you desensitized to some of these noises. One of the things is give the kid control. I had one mom tell me her kid was terrified of the vacuum cleaner. And then they let him play with the vacuum cleaner, turning the vacuum cleaner on and off, and he got to loving it. Now, restrooms, that's the place to just wear the headphones because you can't control the hand dryers. You can't control the automatic toilets. Every one of them is different. Um, but the thing about headphones is don't wear them all the time. You wear headphones all the time, you're going to end up getting more sensitive, and that would be really bad. But if the kid has some control, and that horn on that boat was exactly the same, and that hardly even bothered me. But when I was a kid, I remember when I was five or six, I was on the deck of one of those boats, and I like flung myself on the deck of scramming. And then they finally just let me sit downstairs. Then I was fine. You know, and that's something that you might do. And we, one of the, my number one research priorities is finding ways to desensitize some of the sensory stuff. But I do know, I talked to one mom, her kid went from loving the vacuum cleaner, hating the vacuum cleaner, to loving it. When I was little, I hated balloons. Never knew when they were going to pop. You know how you would deal with that? Might blow it up this big, I pop it. Then maybe that big, I pop it. Gradually make it bigger and louder, but I do the popping. You see, that might be one of the ways to kind of desensitize it. But I do have auditory processing problems. I can't hear... Uh, people's speech accurately when it's background noise. Also, a lot of kids that are different are like a phone on only one or two bars. That takes time for them to respond. Lots of times teachers and parents talk for the kid and don't give him time to respond. That can be a big problem. Well, I think I just want to thank everybody for coming. <laughs>
That's a powerhouse, huh? So this is going, you can view this on voiceofvashon.org in two days. Uh, Temple's presentation will be up on that website so you can go back and watch again. Please share it with folks who weren't able to make it um, tonight. And uh, Temple will be out um, in the lobby again to sign books. So if you didn't get a chance to buy and have your books signed, then she'll be here for a little bit. And thanks so much for coming. And just to also, um, this is really part of the Vashon Sheepdog Classic, which is a fantastic event every year. Uh, my favorite local event here. Um, just big thanks to everybody who works so hard to put that amazing event on every year. And thank you guys so much for coming tonight. It's been a pleasure.